our text is to think about how we can use those texts to engage students with the content. And um, this is in the target language. And so when we think about this, one thing to think about is how can we increase the cognitive complexity for our learners, particularly since most of you participating work with adult learners, while maintaining uh, linguistic simplicity, if you will. Um, and one piece of this is thinking about the language piece. So how do we take these texts and use them to help support students' language development um, in a step-by-step -step way? And one thing that can really help us as we try to generate these tasks is the list of 21st century skills that you see here on this screen. Um, these 21st century skills can give you ideas for generating interesting thinking tasks. So for example, maybe um, in a unit that I did with um, students related to the, the textbook topic was farming, believe it or not, and this was in a Spanish 2 high school class. And the um, way that I sort of shifted that topic was toward the idea of food production. And um, the cultural context that I used was migrant workers um, in the United States and sort of the, the contributions that migrant workers make to um, our, our system of food production. So as I was thinking about tasks, I need to think about culturally authentic texts, first of all, that I can use with students to engage them in that theme. So one really helpful set of texts are children's books. Children's books provide a lot of what I call extra textual support, or in other words, there are a lot of images and illustrations that support students in understanding the meaning of the text. Because they are generally written as narratives, um, although it depends on which kind of children's book you select, the texts generally follow a very predetermined sequence, and that makes them more comprehensible for a lot of students. Um, a third piece is that I can then use those texts to show different perspectives. So one set of texts or, or one children's book that I used was um, a book called El Camino de Amalia, which is the story of a little girl who is the daughter of migrant workers, and it essentially focuses on her experience at school and the idea that she has to move every two months in order to do the different kinds of, um, you know, so that her family can basically follow the harvest in order to continue to remain employed. And it talks about the struggles that that creates for her and the challenges that creates for her in terms of feeling like she belongs and feeling like she has roots. And the story continues by giving sort of a um, kind of demonstrating the interaction that this little girl has with her teacher and a particular conversation that she and her teacher have um, that helps her to solve this problem. I have several other texts that talk about, um, that sort of show snapshots from the lives of, from the life of a child who is a migrant worker. So by taking these two or three texts, one kind of task that I might give students is, first of all, after we, we have engaged with each of these texts, um, which is how I'm providing them input to help them to see different perspectives on the life of migrant workers, then I might give them a comparison chart. So that comparison chart might be things like um, list the name of the child in each of these books. How, you know, maybe there's a section that asks them to do some basic things with their language. Describe the child. Describe the child's circumstances. Use some adjectives that explain what their life is like. Maybe in the third column, I'm going to ask students to think about the things that the child loves about being a migrant worker's child and the things that are difficult. What are some of the problems or challenges and how do the characters in each of the stories solve them and who helps them to do those things. So basically, I'm really asking for who, what, when, where, why, how kinds of language. And the questions that I'm asking allow students to give pretty concrete answers. But in comparing the stories, students have the opportunity to think at a higher level of cognitive complexity. Um, 
where they are having to sort of start to compare and contrast. And I might even have a question on the worksheet that asks students to compare their childhood with the childhoods of these migrant workers. How are things the same? How are they different? So that would be one example. And there are lots of texts that I could use in that unit. Um, Hul Salsa is a book of poetry. Uh, it's bilingual in Spanish and in English. And I have students read the poems in Spanish. But I don't have them read all the poems. I select particular ones that I think are especially relevant to the interests and concerns of my students. So as we're thinking these, about these tasks, we want to develop activities that will accomplish a couple of purposes. And we already talked about these briefly. But if I had to boil this down to three ideas, I would say, help students make meaning from the text. What literally is the text saying? And so activities that ask students to take an entire story and give you a summary of that story in seven simple sentences um, are good options, for example. Uh, things like Venn diagrams that ask students to compare and contrast their life with the life of a character in the story. Um, if we're not using stories, if this is academic text, you can still do similar things. I could give them a graphic organizer and ask them to read through a text like the one that Stephen mentioned where the person listed 10 specific things, and I could ask them to categorize. Is this a positive reason to study abroad or a negative reason to study abroad? Um, you know, what are the pros and cons of a particular argument? And there are a lot of technological tools that will help students to do this as well. The next piece that we need to think about is shifting from these tasks to different kinds of talking. Um, and I'm going to kind of jump between the various T's here as we talk about this one, because I think one thing that's important to understand when we ask students to read a text is that they don't have to read the whole thing, and they don't have to read it all at once. So for example, in the migrant worker unit that I was describing earlier, um, the text that specifically addresses the um, sort of snapshots from the author's life, the very first thing I had students do with that text, um, because it's filled with a lot of figurative language that is conceptually well above and linguistically well above what my students can actually understand or produce. So rather than have drag every single student through that whole entire book, I gave I paired students and gave each student a page from the book. And I asked them to, or actually just the sentence from the book, and I asked them to read the sentence and then to illustrate what it meant. So they had to work with their partner and use other resources such as dictionaries, etc., to figure out what they think, what they thought the sentence meant, and then to visually describe or, or draw that sentence. Once students had done that, then it becomes much easier to, for them to start to understand, oh, even though the author's talking about concrete experiences, he's using this fancy, flowery, figurative, metaphorical language to do that. I can engage them in all sorts of activities related to metaphors and developing metaphors of their own, about their own lives, um, before we move on to the next aspect of the task, of the, the task or the text. Um, a second way to engage students with text is to have each of them read a paragraph. So maybe you and your partner are paired, and you're going to work through a paragraph together. And at the end of the paragraph, you're going to stop and you're going to say something. Now, in beginning level classes, I can't just say, once you get to the end of the paragraph, say what you think. That's way too open-ended for a beginning language learner. I'm probably going to need to provide some sentence frames or some specific questions that I want them to respond to with their partner. Um, so as we're thinking about these kinds of tasks, we, we have to always be thinking in relation to how we're having students read the text, what we're asking students to do with the text, and how we are scaffolding that information for students or those, those tasks so that they become accessible to the student. Um, and that moves us to the idea of talk. So what kinds of things do we want students to talk about? And I think probably the best thing to talk about here is where a lot of this learning breaks down for students. So um, a lot of times we are so focused on whatever our targeted grammatical structure is that we have a tendency to jump straight to that and just want to teach the structure. 
Um, and actually, it might be more beneficial to students if we were to take that structure and give them opportunities to see lots of examples of that structure pulled out of the story and then to see if they can identify the pattern in the language that that structure produces. Uh, the same thing is true with regard to vocabulary. A lot of times we feel like, and especially with beginning classes, well, my goodness, I can't have them do a unit about current events because there are 20,000 words that they don't know that they're going to need in order to be able to understand current events. So my recommendation there is that we narrow our focus a little bit and say, okay, there's a lot of language that I'm going to use with my students over time as we discuss this topic. And just like the cooking metaphor, if you remember, um, over time, you develop more and more skill. They don't have to get it all at once. But what I am going to do is select seven words that I think will transfer into other subjects, into our discussions of other subjects. So one of the things that I think teachers, as language teachers do that is actually very unhelpful to students is we look at a text and we say, okay, the, all the words that the kids won't know in the text are these. And that's what we choose for our vocabulary that we're going to target. When instead, it would be more useful for us to go through that text and say, what are some of the key words that are high frequency expressions that students are going to encounter in lots of different academic texts or settings? Um, and to target those words and to make sure that students are using those words and that the activities require students to use those words over and over and over again and to hear those words in different contexts throughout the whole lesson so that by the time they leave our classroom, they have those seven or 10 words that we have targeted, and they don't even have to think about it because they've had so much experience with those words. Well, if you were to do that every day over time, that builds their vocabulary very quickly and in very powerful ways that a simple list of vocabulary words is not going to help them with. And then the last piece of that is also helping students to share what they've learned with authentic audiences. If they never have a chance to take those patterns that we've pointed out or that they've discovered and those words that we've exposed them to, um, it's very difficult for them to actually uh, integrate those into their lives. The last piece is probably the piece that most of you have a lot of questions about. Um, and it's the piece that we're going to shift to next after we take a few minutes to um, ask or to answer additional questions that you might have related to this chunk of content. Um, but essentially, if we really focus on making input comprehensible and we really focus on providing support in places where the tasks are likely to break down, and then we really focus on making it possible for students to produce language in simple ways, they can handle the complex content in the target language. So in the next um, episode here, we're going to spend some time talking about the different places that learning breaks down and how we can scaffold uh, what we're asking students to do in uh, relation to that. Um, the first place is that we have a tendency sometimes to throw out a lot of disconnected facts. And because they are never connected in a context that is meaningful, it's very difficult for the memory to actually hold on to those because it's difficult for the memory to find or for the learner to find sense or meaning in that. Um, explanations. We tend to give too many explanations that are too complex and too lengthy. And so the idea that we want to create activities where students figure things out as opposed to us providing all of the answers is a really huge conceptual and paradigmatic shift that is sometimes difficult for us as language teachers. Instructions uh, tend to be too wordy, they're unclear, or the input, in other words, the language that we're providing them in is not comprehensible. Now, a lot of project-based language learning teachers feel like it's impossible to give clear instructions um, in the target language. And I would suggest that that's just because we haven't boiled down what exactly and specifically students need to do in order to accomplish the project. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that here in just a minute. Um, the next piece is that we don't provide adequate support. So we ask students to do something 
And they might actually be able to do it with their language if they had support. Kind of like the anal a good analogy for that would be a child learning to ride a bike. Um, if the parent holds on to the back of the bike, or if we put training wheels on the bike, so that the student doesn't have to worry so much about falling off and can just focus on the fundamentals of figuring out how to make their body move the bike, um, and how to steer the bike, and all of those processes, over time, with more practice, the child develops an automaticity with those skills that enable them to actually um, ride the bike, and then we can remove the training wheels. In a similar way, um, as we're developing tasks for students, we really need to build in the training wheels as part of the tasks. And then the last piece is motivation, um, that sometimes what we ask students to do is not very cognitively interesting. It does not engage them emotionally, or it doesn't give the student any sort of control over the task. So this is a recipe that I have typically used with my students um, in order to help them to give successful instructions. And the idea is that you want to put one step on each line, and I make my students number the lines. They can't have more than five lines. When I say students, I mean my student teachers. And they can only use seven to 10 words per step. Now, that obviously will change depending on your language and how your language is structured. But I have found that generally, if it takes me more than five lines to give the instructions, I probably have more than one task there that I'm asking students to do. And I've found that if I force myself to limit the instructions, and then I can always provide additional detail or examples if I need to, that that is more helpful to students um, than if I try to give them big, long paragraphs of instructions. Um, the last piece uh, before we shift to question and answers is the idea of motivation, that in order for students to acquire better proficiency over time, they need to stay motivated to persist with tasks that are difficult for them, to plow through texts that they don't necessarily understand every word of, and to continue to try to speak a language that they don't necessarily feel conf confident or comfortable with. And a lot of the research on motivation suggests some key things that we need to think about when we're asking students to do those things. The first is providing a good balance between the challenge of the task and their skills. And that doesn't mean that we water everything down. Uh, the research has actually shown that students need bite-sized chunks of complexity. When we water it down, we remove all of the cues and information that they need to actually understand the content. Instead, we need to insert support. The second piece is learner autonomy. The more supported they are in completing the tasks, the more autonomy they have. The third piece is that they need a reason to do the task besides just that we've assigned it. And the fourth is personal relevance. And so if we can build adequate scaffolding and personal connections into our tasks and engage students with projects that are meaningful for them, a lot of these issues take care of themselves. We're now ready to shift to the idea of scaffolding and what are some of the things that we can do in order to support learners in being uh, more successful as they try to read text, uh, speak interpersonally, or present information to audiences of native speakers. Um, in terms of our topic, one way we can scaffold that is by activating students' prior knowledge, providing models of what we want them to do, giving lots of examples so that they can abstract the key patterns and details from those examples, and providing clear instructions. When we're thinking about text, um, a lot of the things that are helpful in scaffolding text we're actually going to talk about in the next slide, but having a meaningful purpose for reading the text, um, good cultural connections, and specific um, ideas and information that we want students to absorb from those texts can be helpful. When we're thinking about tasks, things like pre, during, and post reading, which also is helpful for text, things like process organizers and concept maps and checklists, um, and specific attention to the design of the task, what it looks like and how we format it, dramatically changes students' ability to be successful with the task. And I'll show you some examples here in just a second. And then finally, as we scaffold talk, um, giving students formulas and templates, graphic organizers, word walls, things like that are helpful. Uh, in the um, modules that you can look at after the webinar, 
I have linked up some resources to templates for these kinds of scaffolding tools so that you can get an idea of what they might look like. So to sort of conclude with this particular piece, um, after we've developed an academic, a compelling academic content focus for our project and located relevant texts, we want to think about designing tasks that get students engaging with the content of those texts in meaningful ways. Then we are going to think about what kinds of language, especially academic language, students need in order to discuss the content. And we're going to focus on that as we develop their language and then select appropriate pedagogical strategies for doing so. So um, with that, uh, we are going to spend a few minutes on questions and then we will shift metaphors and look uh, more specifically at scaffolding and what that looks like. Okay, um, and now it's time for the questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, the first question is, in your experience, did adult learners have any issues with using children's books? I personally love children's, children's books myself, but sometimes I wonder if some adult learners might find them, well, childish. That's a great question, and I think that it depends on what kind of children's books you're using. The reality is that most children's books are made to be read by adults or children or two children. In other words, although we tend to think of the child as the audience for the author, and in some ways they, they are, um, it's adults who buy books for kids. And most children's books, if you talk to a lot of the um, children's book authors, will tell you that actually the adult is their primary audience. Um, so I haven't found that to be a problem except when I select the books based on the simplicity of the language as opposed to how well the conceptual content matches what it is that we're working on. So for example, if I were to select children's books that are technically at the level of language that my Spanish 1 students could handle at the beginning of the year, all they would ever get to read are the little baby board books. Um, which are not cognitively challenging. They are not emotionally engaging. There's very little that is satisfying about those to an adult in any way, shape, or form. Um, and both in terms of the text and the illustrations. So um, what I have learned is that rather than going to the books that um, are easiest, I choose the books that are most interesting and then figure out what supports do I need to insert? Do I need to um, use the text in smaller chunks? Do I need to, you know, so that we only read a tiny, you know, page or two and then students go do something and then we come back and read a few more pages and then students go do something? Or do I need, you know, what are the things that I need to do in order to support students in accessing that text? Okay, great. Um, the next question is, how can the teacher make sure that the students use target language, the te target language they are learning instead of their mother tongue in the talk part of PBLL? Uh, I think that's a great question. I don't think that that question is any different from what any language teacher faces with any approach that they might be using. Um, the bottom line is students are, well, actually let me rephrase. So number one, in my experience, I have found that the more I stay in the target language, the more likely students are to respond in the target language. Number two, there are a number of specific scaffolding strategies that you can use. So for example, I can use word walls, where the content area words that students might need in order to interact with um, or discuss a particular kind of content are posted. I might use language ladders, um, where I provide a simple way of saying something, an intermediate way of saying something, and a very formal way of saying something, so that students have a range of expressions to choose from and they start to develop a sense of which context, which expressions are appropriate for which context. So I could say, hey, how are you? I could say, how are you doing today? Or I could say, wow, I'm incredibly you know, pleased to meet you. It is such a great honor. 
each of those things is a greeting, but each of them addresses a different um, context or is appropriate for a different context. So I could teach those sorts of things. Um, how I structure the talk is important. So if I want students to stay in the target language and I'm having them play some sort of a game as part of you know, them acquiring more information about the content, and I haven't given them the social language that they need in order to congratulate one another or do the things that a person would normally do when playing a game, guess what? They're going to jump into English. But if at the bottom of their sheet, so let's say, for example, I don't know, they're playing Battleship or something, then I'm going to put at the bottom some of the kinds of expressions they might need. Good job. Wow. You know, those, those rejoinder expressions. Um, I can't believe that. Are you kidding me? You know, are you serious? Whatever is appropriate for the topic that they're discussing and the um, information that they're being asked to engage with, then those kinds of things can support them. They jump into English when they feel like they can't say what they want to say. So an additional piece would be to teach them circumlocution strategies that will help them um, with those, you know, develop some of the skills so that even at beginning levels, even in language in uh, level one, by the first semester, the end of the first semester, my students could express language well beyond their actual level of proficiency because they had learned to circumlocute. Okay, um, before we get to the last question, I just wanted to give a reminder that the the poll for Lesson 8 is up, so uh, all of our participants, please participate in the poll and give us your feedback. And the final question is, um, what do you do to help students feel okay about not understanding everything? I think the biggest piece is making it evident to students from day one that I don't expect them to. Um, in, and, and I recognize that if you haven't been a teacher who has been teaching in the target language up to this point, and you haven't used project-based language learning, then this is going to be a major shift for you and for your students. And so it's really important, I think, to spend a few minutes with students, helping them to understand why you're choosing to adopt this approach, why it is that staying in the language is going to be so much more beneficial to them in terms of increasing the speed of their learning of the target language um, and the sophistication of their ability to use the language. I think a third piece is that um, I actually give students a little coping card with, the, with sort of sentence starters for basic things that they're probably going to want to say. Um, this is kind of a silly example, but on a, a final, one question, every student got one of the questions right across all six sections of the class that I taught. Uh, and this was a Spanish 1 test, and I thought, oh my gosh, I wonder what that question was. And the answer was saquen papel y lapis, um, which means take out paper and pencil. Now that probably gives you a hint as to what kind of a teacher I was at the time, but every student got it right because they heard that expression every day that they were in class multiple times a day, and they had to do something physical in relation to that expression. And that was a big turning point for me uh, in helping me to recognize that if I want students to acquire these expressions or to acquire fluency in the language, I have got to give them multiple, multiple, multiple opportunities to hear that language and use it in real world context.